I'm going to introduce the um, preliminary and ongoing work on um, um, efforts to build uh, the charcoal database from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And um, um, this initiative involves a lot of people, and I will um, especially like to uh, thank the um, uh, support from the uh, global uh, Paleofire working group um, for, the, um, for the support in this work. Um, okay. So before moving on, I would like to highlight, uh, to start with the, um, the modeling work of Bond with um, um, a world, how the world uh, or the biome, the vegetation we look if we have the fire on and how much different this will be if we turn the fire off. And aside, I try to picture um, different fire regimes um, going from surface fire to crown fire in the boreal forest. And uh, this is um, uh, uh, this illustrates fire in uh, savanna and grassland. And all this uh, type of, of um, uh, burning will introduce uh, um, a different amount of charcoal into the um, uh, sedimentary um, records. More, <clears throat> more if you burn a, um, um, a forest and surface fire or a grass, uh, a grassland. All right. So. Um, uh, Boris um, talked yesterday about the uh, Global Charcoal Database, and I would like to remind you on this. So um, it was built with the idea to explore larger scale patterns in fire activity and explore also drivers of these changes. And then since the um, uh, release in 2008, um, they have several versions now, three versions actually, and I illustrate here the Europe. So with each version, you see more sites across Europe um, this is Central Eastern Europe, and um, there is not so much progress over the years. So I work in this area. I know that my colleagues or paleoecologists they do employ charcoal on a, on a, on a, on in their um, um, uh, vegetation or like fire reconstruction. So I, um, I thought it would be um, a good opportunity to um, fill the gap and also to understand the fire ecology and the role of the fire in land cover changes in this uh, uh, region as well. Um, <clears throat> so um, that was possible thanks to uh, um, funding for DFG, but also from PAGES. Um, uh, uh, so um, uh, we organized a workshop last uh, uh, December in Frankfurt. Uh, were about 25 participants from, um, so data per, uh, persons and also uh, modelers. Um, um, most of the, a lot of young scientists, and we um, get to learn about the a global charcoal data set and how to contribute to, to this one. We also learn how to work with the paleofire package and um, um, more or less everybody came with the several records, so we had 44 in total, and we play with this, um, um, the records, and we already had some preliminary work um, after the workshop. Um, so um, this uh, figure illustrates how the, um, with the red dots are the, what we uh, fill in after the, these 44 records after the workshop. Uh, okay, follow the, uh, following the workshop, um, uh, the, um, the contribution increased with other seven, 70 new records, um, and this also includes um, a lot of records uh, from Elizabeth's uh, effort to build a um, um, central European <coughs> lowlands uh, chart, um, uh, regional synthesis, so if you Want, if you're interested in this region, you can see the poster um, eight. Um, so we got uh, to uh, 111, uh, 15 charcoal records from this area. So they are, um, um, they are in red, but actually um, not all these. So some of these um, 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 Italian records, actually, they were already in. So um, 
Most of these uh, new charcoal records are micro charcoal. There are also uh, several macro. And among this um, uh, macro charcoal, um, we have uh, nine continuous. So this, there are very um, high resolution um, records. So um, um, we end up with this data set. And um, I'm going to um, uh, present some preliminary work. Um, and since um, this is a land cover, um, more or less, uh, session, so um, try to um, have a first um, uh, grouping of the sites, so um, um, a very crude one. And um, um, uh, this grouping follows the region with a similar deforestation trends based on the percentage of land um, available for agriculture, uh, forest cover. This is the work of Jed, um, and he mentioned this work this morning. Um, so, um, um, this area in brown, um, um, it's um, so translated in a chart records, um, it corresponds with this area. So, whenever you see a brownish curve, that, that uh, refers to Eastern Europe. Whenever you see a bluish curve, it refers to the Central Europe. Um, and this is how uh, this cumulative, so th there are a lot of, so, or, or several steps of data transformation, and we end up with uh, these composite charcoal curves. Um, and um, I would like to um, talk about the upper panel, which um, um, includes, includes the charcoal records from both Eastern and Central Europe. And um, the general trends is a high uh, fire activity in the early Holocene, followed by a decline and the re-increase in the late Holocene. When the records were split in, the, in two different regions, so Eastern and Central Europe, um, we, we uh, found um, uh, some dissimilarities. So we still have this early Holocene, um, um, early, um, um, enhance or high fire activity, but this is somehow delay, uh, and also um, it's a, of a shorter um, a time period. Then we have a, a stronger decline in Eastern Europe, uh, whereas in Central Europe, um, the biomass burning stays higher for a longer time period. Um, but when we get to the late Holocene, we see an increase in Eastern Europe, whereas we don't see this increase in a central part, except of this uh, very, um, um, later part. Um, so just generally these uh, trends in um, uh, fire activity, they follow the summer insulation like uh, on a very general scale except of this uh, late Holocene part. And uh, the second thing, um, because we have because we have so many uh, much more um, uh, records in, from Eastern Europe and they, they are of higher resolution than um, you, this um, um, cumulative uh, curve um, looks more like the Eastern European than the Central European one. Um, so just to see why. why um, okay. So, um, and this is a quick look of um, all these sites together and uh, uh, European uh, um, European biomass burning uh, um, as in in. Um, a Marlon in 2016, but I, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, we like to talk about this one, so the link between fire and land cover changes. Mm, so what I put here, again, I took from uh, Jed's uh, simulation. Uh, so I'm going to focus only on these 3,000 years. Um, so I took the, um, um, the deforestation trends from three, two, and 1,000 years ago. And um, I highlighted Eastern and Central Europe in all three panels um, because they, they nicely follow this, the two curves. So um, what we see here, it's a, um, a deforestation um, trend from the uh, 3,000 years ago to one, uh, to the, yeah, 1,000 years ago. Um, these deforestation trends are stronger in Central Europe as compared to the Eastern part. And um, yeah. And um, if we move on a charcoal panel, um, um, about so around 3,000 years ago, we see this rise, um, and I said, um, which has no correspondent in the last um, 
uh, in the uh, central European part, except of this uh, top. Uh, so, um, uh, <laughs> as a preliminary interpretation, um, um, we said that uh, fire, so probably uh, this curve uh, shows that the fire, so combined, so fire, um, from 2,000 years ago, fire became essential in deforestation in the uh, eastern part of Europe, um, but perhaps it was no longer important in, eastern Euro in Central Europe because Central Europe was already deforested, so the fire was probably used to maintain the openness or remove the harvest or other activities that put in a, a lower amount of charcoal. Um, so that's quite preliminary. So. Um, um, that's about um, um, these results, so I think it's a lot, there's a lot of more information to extract um, because um, the sites, so the, um, the whole of this area was um, um, unified in, uh, or was clustered in uh, Eastern Europe, but it's a large area with um, uh, latitudinal transect in, um, uh, latitudinal gradient, sorry, in climate and vegetation uh, um, as well as elevation. So we, we need to separate the information from this area into smaller um, regions um, and then to evaluate this uh, trends in biomass burning against other uh, uh, proxy or um, model uh, data set. So with this I'm finishing and I would like to, thanks, to thank you very much. Just a, a comment on uh, Central European forest history um, between three and 1,000 years ago. That's actually the area where there is the greatest divergence between KK10 and the pollen evidence. Um, pollen synthesis for Central Europe actually show the major forest clearance across that area was in medieval times. And, and it doesn't matter whether you use reveals or PFT, whichever method you use, it, it's and historical evidence is also very clear. They, they talk about the Grand Défrichement. That area was the last area of Europe to be largely cleared. So actually, it matches your Central European charcoal curve much better than the than the um, the, the, the modelling does. So, okay. so I, th I think thank there you. is a good fit actually. Okay, thank you. Your fire history for the Eastern European part yes. is extremely similar to the southern Swedish history, which fits with your interpretation, in fact. Hello, everyone. My presentation today is about combining archaeological and paleo data to study past human environment interactions. But before I start, I wanted to say thank you to the PAGES organizing committee for having me here, because if I had been at home, I would have been living through a massive flooding event that just happened. <laughs> Um, one of the worst ones we've had in over 40 years. So some parts of Ottawa have, well, and the outskirts of Ottawa have over one meter of water right now because the ground is still frozen and there was four days of constant rain. And some people got snowstorms and mudslides on top of that. So <laughs> I just thought it was neat to bring it up at a conference about global challenges. And uh, it's so rare because parts of central, eastern, and western Canada are all experiencing the same precipitation patterns. But uh, I'm not a, cli a climate scientist, I'm a geographer. So <laughs> back to my uh, real presentation, which is about a research program I've been involved with for the last few years um, with two core objectives, the first of which is to quantify past human impacts on North American ecosystems using a big data approach. And the second is to build an openly accessible global archaeological radiocarbon database with data that can be used as a proxy for population change. So I'd like to introduce you to the database and then I'll show some results that combine these data with uh, paleo data to um, examine human environment relationships. So the database is being called the Canadian Archaeological Radiocarbon Database but that was not my choice. And I find it kind of odd considering it's a global database. <laughs> so when I talk to people, I call it the comprehensive archeological database because I think that's a bit better. But regardless, it's, uh, it's a database that contains radiocarbon measurements for the ages of archeological finds from various excavation sites across the world. 
And uh, it's essentially a compilation of the regional databases that are currently existing and any um, dates, individual dates that have been published in the literature. So I have to acknowledge the fact that the database wouldn't have been possible without decades of work by hundreds of researchers who made their data available online. So this is the website for the database and uh, you're all invited to contact the curators and ask for permission to use the database, which would mean downloading data and also uploading your own, which is something that we strongly encourage. And uh, permission would be required just because we want to protect the integrity of the excavation sites against vandalism and also avoid misuse of the data. And when the project first started in 2015, uh, the first regional database that we incorporated was uh, covering Canada and the United States. And that was just over 33,000 individual dates from several thousand uh, sites that you can see here. But today, we have um, equivalent coverage across the globe, which I find is quite impressive. Uh, there are still a few spots that are lacking data, so in Mexico, Greenland, India, for example. But right now, there's over 100,000 dates in the database. And what's really nice about it is the data structure for dates from different regions is the same, and all of the information is available in one place. So we're working on making it more of a hub where the regional databases that exist would be more interoperable. And we still have to work on data scrubbing and providing calibration and statistical services. But uh, right now you can download these data in a spreadsheet format and you'll get information about the location, the ages, the context, uh, the cultures, etc. So we're hoping this is very valuable to people who are doing um, studies on past human populations, specifically those that are using the dates as data method. So this is a concept that goes back to the early 60s, but it was John Rick who first described the idea of using the number of radiocarbon dates um, from a given area to show patterns in human occupation through time. And this method is inherently biased, so you need quite a large sample size to be able to show the true overview of the regional trends. So the assumptions of the method are that an intense occupation would lead to more archaeological deposits, and the deposits that survive in the archaeological record would be proportional to that original deposition. Thus, the number of radiocarbon dates that are eventually collected would be um, representative of those surviving deposits as well as uh, the original um, intensity of occupation. So you can't get exact numbers, obviously, with this, but you can get an idea of relative population change. And because um, different cultures and different activities can lead to differential deposition, uh, because um, younger dates tend to be overrepresented than older dates, um, the dates tend to be spatially uneven um, in terms of where they are geographically. And depending on the research question, some areas might be more intensely sampled than others. Because of all of these things, um, there are quite a few biases that need to be taken into account or corrected for. But uh, I'd like to show you that this method is very useful. So this is the paleodemographic curve for North America using the dates as data method. Um, and so just on the left hand side you have the number of radiocarbon dates and on the x-axis you have the ages in uh, CalBP. So the orange bars would represent the sum of dates in 100 year time intervals and the black line represents the exact same thing only it's been corrected for taphonomic bias using a model that accounts for the fact that older dates tend to be underrepresented. So that would be what we would consider the true curve for North America. And at this scale, we can easily see that there are relative changes in population density through time. So in the early and mid Holocene, population density is quite low. After 6,000, it slowly starts to increase. Between 2,000 and 500 BP, we're getting a, a strong or rather rapid increase, after which the number of radiocarbon dates drops off because of um, the post-contact spread of European diseases that affected the indigenous population, and also the fact that radiocarbon dating is no longer necessary in the historical period. 
And these trends coincide quite nicely with um, in independent estimates of population growth from historical records and land use models. What's also interesting at this scale is the correlation between uh, population and climate. So here, the upper red curve is uh, the mean July temperature anomaly curve for North America, extending back to 14,000 BP. And so that would just be the, the changes in summer temperature through time. And then the red curve more towards the middle is the exact same thing, but it's been truncated at 10,000 BP just to show the increased variability during periods of um, warmer temperatures and colder temperatures, which are the, the pink and blue. So here it looks more pink and white. <laughs> Uh, and then the black curve on the bottom is the paleodemographic curve that we just saw. So for the early and mid Holocene, um, population tends to track temperature quite closely. Uh, in the warmer periods, when temperature is warm or increasing, population growth starts to happen. And in the colder periods, um, temp uh, population is stable or perhaps dips down a little bit. And then uh, after 3000 BP um, in the neoglacial, the, the relationship is the opposite. So temperature is increasing, temperature is decreasing, but population is increasing. And uh, that's because agriculture comes in, the people are more sedentary, and so population growth persists despite uh, the temperature trend. Uh, so I just made this graph a few weeks ago, actually, um, and so it, I find it quite interesting, but I think we need to perhaps look at things like precipitation or winter temperatures or maybe do a, a more regional analysis. Uh, because I have a colleague who has shown that the DASIS data method works quite well at a regional scale in North America. So he used radiocarbon dates from the northeastern United States. And what he showed was when you get distinct, distinct changes in uh, moisture availability and temperature, you also get changes in cultures as well. So he divided his radiocarbon dates based on cultural descriptions, which are the colored histograms that you see at the bottom, except now zero BP is on your right-hand side. And uh, so the purple would be Paleo-Indian, the green and blue would be archaic, and then the yellow and orange and red would be uh, woodland cultures. And then above that, in the blue, you have a, a record for lake level changes, and in the black, you have a record for temperature changes. And so when you see um, after the classic 8.2 or 5.4 uh, regime shifts, you also get distinct uh, transitions in the cultures. Um, and then we've been working lately on making maps uh, based on the number and spatial distribution of radiocarbon dates in 500 year time slices throughout the Holocene. Uh, so this is just an example from 3000 BP. And these are, I find them very interesting because you get to see changes in population density in both space and time. And when we look at the series of maps that we produced, we get the same story as with the paleodemographic curve. So population density is low in the early Holocene, and then it increases exponentially towards the present. And uh, these are neat too, because you get to see that migration happened really quickly after uh, the original colonization via Beringia. And the largest population centers tend to exist along the coasts and in the Eastern United States. So I had a poster on this and also the following slide, upstairs number three. Uh, so this is the latest thing that we've been working on. So we want to correlate our maps of population change with equivalent maps of abundance change for individual tree taxa. Uh, it's not very easy to do, but uh, it seems promising because uh, we're seeing um, correlations between population and mass producing trees and then almost no correlations for trees that would exist in um, the boreal forest which is somewhere that humans wouldn't really be uh, interacting with too much. So there's still quite a bit to be done here but I hope that you find uh, these methods promising. Uh, we're going to continue to build our global radiocarbon database and uh, work towards improving the dates as data method. We need to make sure that we're, we're improving um, the bias corrections, for example, making um, the corrections more regionally specific or making them variable in time. Uh, 
And then we also need to continue with regional studies because I think that's where we're gonna tease out those finer fluctuations in population change and also get a better picture so that we can incorporate these types of data with land use models. And we're collaborating with um, researchers from different parts of the world so that maybe we can one day get a global population curve, which I think would be quite impressive. Um, so there's the website again in case you didn't get it and thank you so much for listening. Can you talk a little more about the comparison with the pollen data and the population curves, like the Quercus you showed? Well, we, we started off, I think we started off with uh, 10 different taxa, uh, probably the, the major ones for North America, so things like spruce and pine, um, hickory, chestnut, oaks, those kinds of things. And um, it, it's, it's a little bit difficult in part because of the the areas where the data is sparse in both the, the radiocarbon data and the vegetation data. But um, what we tried to do was we limited the comparison to the range of the taxon that we selected. So for example, for Quercus, um, if it's just occurring in the southeast, then we would just do a correlation between population and uh, that taxon in that area. Um, and then we tried to expand it by looking at lagged correlations, so um, asking the question of what happens if population changes or comes into the region and then there's a resulting vegetation change, or what happens if it's the opposite, what happens if there's a, a climatically driven vegetation change and then the people come into the region. So we've, we've looked at lagged comparisons as well and it, it doesn't really seem to change the correlations too, too much, but uh, again, this is quite new, so I think uh, we, we still have a lot of thinking to do about that, yeah. I've seen that uh, one of your next steps is uh, producing, uh, well, extending your approach to the rest of the world. Do you expect any problem uh, when uh, well, studying uh, areas with a lower coverage of data, like Africa, for instance, I guess, or Asia, perhaps? Yes. Yes, so actually the biggest thing that I'm worried about is um, we've made regional time series for large regions like um, Southern Asia or Central Europe or um, China. We have a couple different curves for those regions and what's happening is as soon as um, you have the introduction of like coins or lasting historical objects or records, the radiocarbon dates just stop. So instead of getting that nice um, exponential increase, it starts and then it just kind of cuts off. So that's gonna be a, a major problem. We're gonna have to work towards combining the radiocarbon data, archeological data, and perhaps census data or some sort of uh, population counts to, to try and maybe model those types of things before we can actually get a global curve. But uh, yes, so that's why I'm encouraging people to be generous and donate their data so that we can do that. <laughs> Peter, earlier this week, remarked that this presentation had the longest list of co-authors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's testament to sort of the efforts that we've been doing to sort of garner the, the researchers that are active in East Africa uh, to participate in this land cover 6K and uh, parallel projects to that. Um, but also in bringing together paleo people, archaeological um, uh, researchers, as well as anthropologists. And, and so a lot of this has been to bring data together from East Africa with all these different lines of evidence. Um, and we're working towards a, a synthesis <clears throat> metadata paper as a first step towards the Land Cover 6K initiative focused in East Africa. And then we're branching out from there to start to bring together the data for the continent. Uh, so um, Land Cover 6K was introduced earlier today, um, but in essence, we're bringing together this data to think about land cover change in the past and how we can use that to examine the model outputs as well. And then using these reflections on the past and the processes that have led to these types of land use and land cover changes, and thinking about the future of these landscapes. Um, and we especially want to improve these land cover models for parts of the tropics. 
and also to improve the resolution of these models to scales that are relevant to land managers, especially um, in countries like Kenya and Tanzania, where uh, land management decisions are based on a finer resolution than what the models can give us. Uh, so a lot of my work has been on the paleo-environmental side and bringing data together uh, from lake sediments and swamp sediments and things. But we also work with uh, historical ecologists to bring information on land cover from early European mapping of the regions. Um, and also for the more recent past, looking at satellite uh, imagery and things and analyzing the short time interval and mixing that with the paleo and as well as more human data. So focusing on East Africa, uh, bringing together about, we have 125 paleo environmental records that are 6K relevant. Um, and we can look at how they are distributed across space and we can see there's still a lot of gaps, especially in central Tanzania. Uh, and northern Kenya especially is quite difficult to, to build paleo environmental records and that hasn't happened yet. So even given that this coverage is quite, quite good, um, there's still some gaps in very key areas as well as in biodiversity hotspots. But just thinking about land cover in this area of the world, it's very, very diverse and there's strong gradients over short distances. Um, so these are just an example of some of the, the biomes that uh, we're working in. So we, we have periglacial sites at the top of large mountains, Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya, et cetera. Uh, as you move down the mountain, there's large ericaceous belts, different uh, montane forests from dry montane forests as well as very wet montane forests. Um, and then in the lowlands, there's lots of semi-arid savannas uh, and also scrublands and even very arid ecosystems. And this just nine photos doesn't really show all the different biomes that we're working with here. There's mangrove ecosystems and, and others as well. Uh, so this is just an example of one paleo site that we've worked in uh, in the Ark Mountains, Mount Shangena. And we, we had taken a, a short core out of um, a small mire near the top of the mountain. And recently, the tops of these mountains have been altered by, by humans for forestry. Uh, so there's a lot more open areas, and it changes the, the hydroclimate of the, of the top of the mountain. So this particular core gave us a record that goes back from 2000 AD to 700 AD. And we could see that charcoal had increased, suggesting there was a change in the fire regime, a lot more burning. And pioneer taxa and forest disturbance indicator taxa also had been increasing towards presence. It's sort of a stepwise um, progression throughout the, the recent uh, past. And that's due to that intensification of forestry or removing trees uh, in this particular mountain area. So a very local signal for just one top of a, a hill, and that's one example of some of the work we've been recently doing. Uh, and to keep moving forward with this, there's a new three-year project funded by the Swedish International Development Agency. Um, I'm happy to be a part of this now uh, from, through the University of Uppsala. Um, and we're also, they'll also be hiring a position for a land cover modeler as well. Um, and I believe that that call should be out for applications. And, and the, these projects are really to start bringing together all that paleo and uh, use it to compare with model outputs and bringing this information together. Uh, and part of this is that a lot of this type of data and things that we produce is quite complex. Uh, so we're also working on a lot of communication and um, knowledge exchange in East Africa. So producing, instead of the squiggles and very uh, um, you know, detailed maps that we produce, and building more simplistic models that people can actually see and then use on the ground and think about the, the landscape that they live in, what it had looked like in the past, and hopefully inform the future decisions for land management um, in, in particular areas.
So thinking on a more local scale to, you know, um, but at, at a resolution that we don't usually get with the model outputs. So um, a lot of this information, because the, the landscape is so heterogeneous and there's so many different land uses that are overlapping, there's still a need for a lot more information from different areas. And because of those large gaps that we, we see across the space, we need a modeling approach to start to interpolate uh, in, spatially on these maps. Uh, and so that's something that the, the, the new project is going to start looking into a lot, lot, in a lot more detail. So these were recent maps that we've just produced. Uh, the black dots are actual the paleoenvironmental sites that have a 6K record or, or less. Um, and we've just been looking at environmental maps, like temperature and precipitation elevation and things like that, and we can plot out the frequency and histograms of, of these sites to start to think about where the data gaps still are. And then this is how, how many sites there are in these different time slices where we'd like to produce a land cover map. That's just a couple other environmental um, descriptors. And sort of the goals for what this, this effort is um, moving towards is sort of bringing together the paleoenvironmental sites, and that involves working with European and North American and researchers from Kenya, Uganda, and neighboring countries as well. So to bring all that data that's available together and start to move towards actually interpolating across those spaces and building the land cover change maps, and then thinking about projections into the future. And then this information will feed into a continental, hopefully, data set and global, the Land Cover 6K initiative. So thank you for listening. How are you going to use the pollen data? Because what you have shown is very much archaeological based, maybe, historical? Um, well, the, the sites there were paleo sites of all sorts, pollen being one of the dominant proxies, but um, we have yet to present sort of the spatial distribution of the archaeological sites, and that's going to be a major effort in the, in the future job roles mm -hmm. to actually, there's a lot of um, archaeological sites that aren't published, but they're published in, in books in the archives there, in Dar and Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're going to start building that together and see what the spatial distribution and temporal distribution is of the archaeological work. Um, but I, I'm not sure, I, I guess the first step will be to, to compare the model outputs to the, the pollen records okay. as the first step. Mm -hmm. I'll be around all day, so if anyone has sort of comments or suggestions on how to, you know, work with so many diverse disciplines to actually have all the conversations on the ground and to actually, you know, have people mixed together, that would be really interesting to hear some lessons learned from people. And I think we're, I've seen sort of in the past three or four years uh, working on these projects a lot of healthy collaboration and sort of an increasing pace and intensity that other researchers are getting involved now, especially historical ecologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, and us paleo people. I'm very glad to present my work here. The title of this work is Pollen Productivity Estimate and Pollen-Based Quantitative Reconstruction of Policy Vegetation Cover for the Purpose of Climate Modeling. I would like to appreciate my uh, thanks to, show my thanks to all the co-authors that are listed here and all the others that uh, have helped me with field work and data contributors. And also, uh, this work is uh, yeah, the financial support and uh, uh, this work is a contribute for land cover 6K.
uh, you have seen this uh, map from uh, Mahajosia and uh, Colin. I, I just want to emphasize that, uh, uh, just let you notice the differences between these three scenarios. Uh, because they have large discrepancies, so they need to be evaluated with empirical data of land cover. And in this evaluation, uh, pollen-based land cover data have great potential. Uh, those have been working with pollen, might be familiar with this pollen diagram. However, this pollen uh, percentage in the pollen diagram is not the same as the percentage of vegetation cover because different pollen have different pollen productivities. Therefore, models of these pollen vegetation relationships have been developed to study, to translate this pollen percentage data into plant abundances. Shinya Sugita suggested a modeling approach to correct bias due to differences in pollen productivity of different species and the dispersal ability of different pollen types. This model approach is called the reviews model. So by using pollen records from one or a few large lakes or several small sites to apply this reviews model, that regional vegetation can be estimated. Given that we have the estimates of pollen productivity and the full speed of pollen, and the regional scale for this reviews model is about 100 by 100 kilometers, and it is the relevant scale for climate modeling. Because we need pollen productivity, so the, uh, the objective of my, of my studies are to get pollen productivities for taxa that char characteristic of cultural landscape, and to use this uh, pollen productivity for the pollen records uh, in temperate China for a purpose of get a reverse estimate for the uh, temperate China. The study region for um, calculating po pollen productivity are conducted in cultural landscape of Shandong province. And uh, the study region for study two covers temperate China. The studies are structured as follows. Um, because uh, uh, here this is a typical view of the Shandong province uh, because uh, the agriculture Traditional agricultural landscapes are still found in, this, uh, uh, in the low mountain regions of this province. So this uh, region was selected as the study of pollen productivities. Here you see uh, modern agricultural landscape lands in the plains, uh, traditional agriculture in the low mountains with terraces, and uh, the grazing land above the terraces. Here is another typical view of this, this kind of landscape. You see here the traditional agriculture land with terraces and uh, a mix with mixture of uh, cultivated trees such as pine, oak, chestnuts, and robinia, and uh, grazing land above the terraces. To calculate pollen productivity, we need a, a value called extended R-value model. This model expresses a linear relationship with vegetation data on the x-axis and the pollen data on the y-axis the, with an intercept. The slope of the least, this linear relationship is pollen productivity, and this, the intercept is uh, the background pollen, which represents pollen coming from beyond the source area of the pollen. Yeah, we, if we have pollen data and vegetation data, we can calculate this relative pollen productivity. So we need the two types of input data for this YAVI model, pollen data and vegeta vegetation data. For this study, pollen data was extracted from 36 randomly distributed sites in, this, in Shandong, and uh, the vegetation survey was conducted in the field. Because vegetation data need to be distance weighted, therefore, the uh, vegetation for within 10 meters are did more detail with 21 positive quadrants, and the vegetation communities was mapped for 10 to 100 meters, and the satellite image are used for beyond 100 meters. Uh, there are uh, three ERV submodels and the two alternative distance weighting methods. Therefore, we got six values for each taxa. Uh, 
And these values are relevant to one taxa. In this case, it's grass set to one. Uh, in general, trees have large pollen productivity, such as pine, chestnuts, oak, uh, and herbs have lower pollen productivities, uh, such as sedges and others. Artemisia is a herb, but with high pollen productivity, and uh, Robinia is tree, but with low pollen productivity. And there are 10 studies of relative pollen productivity available in China. We uh, evaluated all the values in these 10 studies and made a selection and calculated mean values for the, to get a, a standard data set of relative pollen productivity. With this standard data set, we applied the reviews model on pollen records that covers the Holocene uh, from northern China to get reviews estimate for this region for the first time. Because the selection of the study region are governed by the availability of the pollen productivity, because we have pollen productivities only from northern China, therefore the six of the eight broad vegetation zones are selected for the reverse reconstruction. The pollen records are either from lakes in blue here or from bogs in black here. Uh, because pollen, uh, we use uh, long time intervals to get uh, uh, is the, the time interval is 100 to 500 years to get a more reliable re reverse estimate and to lower the error estimate. For recent time period, the time window 100 to 350 years, and from 700, the time interval are 500, is 500 years. To further maximize the reliability of the reverse model, we use several pollen records for each round, and the grouping are based on modern biogeography factors and climate factors in combination with a numerical analysis of PCA for the selected time window of the Holocene. It results in 35 subgroups. Uh, here, I only chose to present the three eastern site groups. It covers, it includes 13 site, sites. They are from cool temperate conifer deciduous mixed forest, warm temperate deciduous forest, and temperature stepper. Here I show the general difference between the uh, pollen percentage and the reviews estimates. In general, uh, coniferous trees such as pine is overrepresented by pollen percentage because here it's 15 for, uh, in pollen percentage, but it's only five in reverse estimate. Uh, deciduous trees such as birch is also re overrepresented by pollen. It is 10 here in pollen percentage, but it's only one in reverse estimates. Artemisia is also overrepresented by pollen percentage. It's 40 here, but it's only four in reverse estimates. Canopotiaceae, there's not a big difference, but for uh, grasses and the sedges, it's 10 for each in pollen percentage. However, it's 30 for grasses and 40 for sedges. Uh, other herbs such as um, uh, are also underestimated the same as sedges and grasses. Uh, the results are represented as individual taxa or groups of taxa. The trees characteristic of forest are in green and blue here, uh, and uh, the uh, grasses and the uh, plants that characteristic of open vegetation are in red, yellow, orange, and brown here. Uh, so the uh, change of these four groups can be interpreted in terms of uh, uh, either climate or human-induced open vegetation. In temperature, uh, coniferous deciduous mixed forests, yeah, the results are somewhat different between the northeast of the study region and the southwest of the study region. In northeast, the large openings are due to sedges growth on the bog. It's local, it's no, there's no human activity showing here. And in the southwest, uh, sorry. 
And in the warm temperature deciduous forest, there is a sign of deforestation already studied 9,000 years ago, and the regeneration of forest cover from 4,000 to 2,500, and the re-deforestation from 2,500. Uh, the archaeological findings show that there is uh, the uh, origin of uh, agriculture started the latest 7,500 years, which agrees well with our reverse reconstruction. Uh, in temperate China, <laughs> sorry, in temperate stepper, the, um, there is an uh, increase of forest cover from 11,000 years to until 7,500 or 6,000 or, or 4,000, and uh, followed a significant decrease of forest cover. Uh, the interpret of changing of openness is uh, due to climate change or human activities is difficult to, uh, with archaeological sites uh, findings. But luckily, we, are, uh, we have quite a lot of uh, archaeological sites in this region. And this archaeological data shows that the uh, origin of agriculture started uh, around 7,000 years ago, and uh, substantial uh, agriculture started around 4,700 years and a wide spread of human activity around 2,800 to 2,200 years, which agrees very well with our reverse reconstruction. And a very interesting thing here is that uh, the migration of humans shown by archaeological findings are uh, correlate, correlated with our um, reverse estimate of deforestation here because for site group five, it and it's, uh, the deforestation started 7.5 years of uh, 7.5 ka, and for site group seven, it's 6 ka, and for eight and nine, it's uh, 4 ka. There's, there is uh, no uh, human activity showing by this reverse estimate in northeast part of the study region, and uh, there is a uh, increase of forest cover mainly pine in, rec mainly pine in recent time. Um, here comes my conclusion. The reverse estimate of plant vegetation cover percentage are significantly uh, different from the pollen percentage. Deforestation by human is demonstrated uh, in most vegetation zones from around 7,500 or 6,000 or 3,000 years ago and openness was very large from around 2,000 years ago. Take home message for you. Now, uh, first reconstruction of uh, a past land over the last 11,000 years is now available for temperate China, and it can be evaluated in cooperation with archaeologists. Compared to the reverse reconstruction of past land cover openness, the scenario of the uh, anthropogenic uh, land cover from the high database and the estimate open land in many areas. Using pollen based description of past land cover in climate modeling will allow to study the effect of human induced land cover change with significantly improved precision. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Would you consider any benefit to removing Cyperaceae from the whole assemblage? Yes. You mean I remove Cyperaceae from the uh, pollen diagram? Uh, from my yeah, yeah. We are we have considered this, and uh, we are, we, our next step is to remove uh, Cyperaceae to take away the local um, components from these reverse estimates. Yeah. Thanks to the organizers of this session. My name is Lori Staley. I'm from Montana State University. Um, and my collaborators on this project are Kathy Whitlock and Simon Haberly. I'll be talking about climate and human influence on vegetation fire records in Tasmania, Australia. This is work that was part of my PhD dissertation research. 
So as I'm sure you all know, Tasmania is an island off the southeast coast of Australia here. It's uh, in the temperate southern hemisphere mid-latitudes between about 40 and 44 degrees uh, latitude. And our study site is in the western part of the state in the mountains here, Cradle Mountain National Park. So for the purposes of this presentation, uh, I'll be discussing this uh, research question, how have climate and anthropogenic burning impacted fire activity at Cradle Mountain over the course of the Holocene? And the methods that we use to address this question are reconstructing the vegetation history from pollen and charcoal used to reconstruct fire histories. This is macro charcoal, uh, continuously sampled throughout the core, taken from lake sediment cores. And we compared this to independent climate proxy data and archeological information. I would like to give you some context if you don't already know about the Tasmanian setting in particular about human use. Aboriginal peoples arrived in Tasmania about 40,000 years ago. So this is a very long history of human occupation on the island. And there's quite a bit of research, especially recently, discussing the impact that uh, people have had on landscapes and their use of fire being very skillful and sophisticated um, in different environments. Is that me? Anyways, okay, well, so um, Aboriginal land management is a feature of uh, a lot of work in Tasmania. We can see what this may look like on uh, the southern, uh, southwest coast of Tasmania. These are treeless open patches that are uh, existing inside of a greater system of forest and that are separated by small corridors of woodlands. So these patches, uh, you can see them on the landscape today in various parts of western Tasmania, and they've been investigated by uh, different ecologists, anthropologists, etc., cetera, um, to figure out what is the origin and or maintenance of these patches. Uh, some of them are probably made by people and maintained by people, while other patches may have arisen naturally. Regardless of the origin or the persistence of the patches, the important thing to note about them is that they made hunting predictable for Aboriginal peoples. Um, so the macropods, a terrestrial uh, prey species that Aboriginals tended to target, like to gather in places like this where they can shelter in the woodlands and forage in open areas. A bit about our study site at Cradle Mountain. So this is Cradle Mountain Lake St. Clair National Park. This is in the northwest part of Tasmania. Um, this is part of the Tasmanian Wilderness, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Area. It's a topographically complex area from glacial processes. And about one third of Tasmania's vascular flora are found here, so it's a very diverse place. Um, I hope you can see on this satellite image the big differences between Western and Eastern Tasmania in terms of the vegetation. There's quite a distinct divide there in the coloration of the vegetation. That's primarily due to a strong west-east precipitation gradient. Cradle Mountain is part of this very wet side of the spectrum, receiving up to three meters of rain per year. Here's a photograph showing two of our study sites, uh, one lake here and the larger lake here. And what I hope you can notice in this, in this photo is that the vegetation is really quite heterogeneous in structure. There's many different vegetation types that you can see at Cradle Mountain today, um, sort of exemplified by these circles. And I wanna show you a couple pictures of, of three of these in particular. So this is the cool temperate rainforest. This has a very wet microclimate um, and has very long-lived trees. Um, this is Athrotaxis species and the trees in this patch here are over a thousand years old, some of them. So this is a long persisting forest patch uh, at, on the landscape here. Right next door uh, is a grassland, um, which if you've been to Cradle Mountain, you know you can often find wombats and wallabies and all such interesting animals foraging in these grasslands. These patches here in the dashed line indicate 
uh, eucalyptus dominated wet sclerophyll woodlands. So these are eucalyptus overstory with a dense shrubby understory. So I'll show you uh, data from five sites. They're all over 900 meters in the northern part of the park here. Um, so five charcoal records were combined and three pollen records were also uh, combined. We'll look at that data and talk about what the drivers of uh, fire and vegetation change are over the Holocene. So these are the paleoclimate records that we used to compare to our sites. Uh, we have some local or more regional uh, data from sea surface temperatures, lake levels, speleothem, and we also looked at uh, El Nino events and the position or strength of the southern hemisphere westerly winds in the Tasmanian sector and air temperatures. This is a, a graph showing stacked bars with that paleoclimate data. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through this one by one, but rather I'll show you in the next few slides um, the summary of this from the different periods in the Holocene. So here's our data. These top five curves are composite records from using generalized additive models of different vegetation types. And the bottom is five records composited also with a GAM of the fire activity. And then you can see the summary of the climate at the bottom here. So if we look here at the early Holocene, we see this is a period of prolonged high fire activity, um, multi-millennial high fire activity. The vegetation during this period is quite dynamic uh, with grassland decreasing, have a increase in sedge land at this time. For anyone who knows Tasmania, that's primarily button grass, which we think is a response to the fire. Um, also, the rainforest begins to develop around 10,000 years ago. This was a period that was warm, relatively, and the southern westerlies were weak in the Tasmanian sector during this period. In the middle Holocene, that's when we see this rainforest maximum period. The rainforest is very high at all the sites during this period. Grasslands and eucalyptus woodlands are low. Fire activity is low. Um, this occurs during a period which is wet and when the southwesterly winds were relatively strong in the Tasmanian sector. And all across the island we see, or not the whole island, but the western half of the island, we see many records which display this pattern of rainforest maximum in the middle Holocene. And then in the late Holocene, we see a big increase in fire around 4,000 years ago, which is co-occurring with an increase in the eucalyptus woodlands and a decrease in rainforest taxa. You can see once the sclerophyll woodlands are established, uh, fire activity remains relatively low. I think this is a biomass signal. Um, the driving sort of climate of this period is the uptick in INSO events, which created more interannual and interdecadal variability. This is also a relatively cool and dry time period. So we wanna compare this, of course, to the archeological data. There are three sites that are within 25 kilometers of Cradle Mountain, um, and they are of considerable antiquity, all predate the Holocene. And the archeological data that I'll show you includes um, radiocarbon dated occupation layers, as well as inferred occupation intensity. So this would have to do with the number and kind of uh, human artifacts that are found in these deposits. And this is from the archeological literature of these excavations and re-examinations of that uh, material. So here's a photo showing a stratigraphy of one of these sites. And, and what you'd get is layers in which there's a lot of uh, you know, evidence of human butchery of animals and discarded objects, and then also layers which don't have any human artifacts. So there's sort of a, um, you know, periods when humans were present and not present. And here's just a photo of what these look like. So here I'm still showing you the rainforest and the eucalyptus and the fire, but I've added to the top of this diagram um, a heterogeneity kind of index. This is sort of an inferred vegetation mosaic. How was the structure of the uh, vegetation over time? So this is uh, from comparing the modern 
um, pollen samples with the vegetation that exists on the landscape today, as well as some analyses that I haven't shown here, including palynological richness and square chord distance. Um, so what we think is that in the early Holocene and the late Holocene, we had a more heterogeneous structure. I showed you those photos a few minutes ago of um, how the landscape today looks and has many different vegetation communities on it. The antiquity of today's vegetation mosaic that we see at Cradle Mountain, I think dates back to about four or 5,000 years ago um, when you see the rise in eucalyptus woodlands. And you'll notice that the archeological information uh, lines up with the uh, vegetation mosaic. So during periods when the vegetation was arranged in a more heterogeneous fashion, this is when we see more evidence or only evidence of people uh, present in the three archeological sites nearby. So this uh, agrees well with um, a theoretical perspective that was um, advanced by Richard Cosgrove first and updated more recently by Ann Pike Tay of Aboriginal land use in Western versus Eastern Australia. So the model here outlines sort of two different landscapes. In the West, you have resources, which are the black squares, which are simply the terrestrial prey species, such as wallabies, um, that are arranged in patches. So they're not moving all around the landscape. They're sort of concentrated in these specific patches. Whereas in Eastern Tasmania, there's much more movement due to more fertile soils and more abundant landscapes for them to inhabit. So these guys, uh, the Bennett's wallaby, comprise about 75% of the uh, faunal remains that show evidence of human butchery in the uh, archeological deposits in Western Tasmania. And what we know from modern studies is that they really prefer a heterogeneous structure um, that they're more abundant uh, in areas with different habitat types side by, spot, side by side, particularly open areas with woodlands, sclerophyll woodlands. We also know um, from the archeological data uh, examining the mandibles of these guys, uh, for the dental growth rates tell you the time of year, the season that they were killed, um, that the higher elevation sites were visited in summer and these animals were exclusively killed in summer months that were found in those sites and then lower elevation the rest of the year. So this is showing a seasonal strategy of hunting at high elevations in uh, western Tasmania and low elevations um, the rest of the year. So what we think is that the patchiness of the late Holocene and the early part of the early Holocene plant communities may have made the area more advantageous for hunters um, so that these patches uh, formed during um, the late Holocene in particular uh, and would have attracted hunting parties in the summertime. So rather than using fire to create a vegetation mosaic structure at this site, um, we think that that's actually well explained by climate. Um, we suggest that people were using these montane areas in the summertime when the vegetation was already arranged in that mosaic fashion. Um, fire may have been used in a, uh, inside these patches to encourage the growth of tender grasses, um, but we don't see a big signal within the records to indicate um, you know, massive burn off. The, um, the spike that I showed at 4,000 years ago, we've looked at that very closely in each of the individual records compared with the archeological record, and that predates um, the re-arrival or the return of occupation at those sites. Um, so we feel confident that the cause of that large fire activity in the late Holocene was not driven by people, although certainly caution is needed when interpreting archeological data as sort of a one-to-one -one relationship of human presence. So our conclusions uh, here are that the climate was the dominant control on fire and vegetation at Cradle Mountain for the entirety of our records. Um, that there's been limited human modification in the Cradle Mountain landscape, at least that shows up in the lake sediment records. There may have been more super localized um, activity in some patches and that human uh, occupation during the Holocene was coincident with periods when vegetation was arranged in a more heterogeneous or mosaic fashion. 
uh, which we suggest is because humans were advantageously visiting um, the area as part of sort of transient hunting parties in the summer months. So I'd like to thank all the people who contributed to field work and lab work, and of course, um, the many funding and supporting agencies that supported us. Thanks. For the modern pollen, was it pollen traps or sediment that you used? We were using sediment tops from these five lakes and an additional four lakes. Okay. Um, and also, it would be cool to do Michelle's reconstruction of population density on, on the island, if that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So this is some ongoing work, uh, fairly preliminary work, uh, concerned with attempting to reconstruct land cover from pollen records. Archaeological records, um, archaeological sites exist in a landscape. And it's critical for interpreting and understanding those sites to understand the landscape setting. Uh, this slide is a pair of artist reconstructions showing the same stone circle, Neolithic uh, structure, one in a wooded environment and one in open grassland. Understanding the environment gives us a better understanding, or at least a better basis, for understanding how people might have moved around and used that landscape. That was the driver for the funding for this project, which is uh, from um, Historic England. Uh, but as an ecologist, I'm also really interested in the ecological differences between these landscapes. The implications are clearly very wide. And translating pollen records into some kind of mapped form is therefore something pollen analysts have been trying to do since the earliest days of the subject. Farong has very nicely outlined for us the reveals approach, which is producing these subcontinental scale reconstructions. But for my questions, I want to work at a slightly smaller scale, so we're using the multiple scenario approach. We begin, as with most such methods, with, I managed to make this work, with paleoecological pollen assemblages from known sites in a known landscape. We take a calibrated model of pollen dispersal and deposition. The results presented here use the same calibration model that Farong discussed. Thank you, Farong, very handy. But we also take as inputs the character of the particular landscape those sites came from. So that might include the topography, the geology, the substrate, and also the characters of the pollen sites themselves. We know something about their size, we know something about the kind of wetland that's within them. And we can ta also could take our ecological understanding of where past vegetation is likely to be found, what was likely to be in the area. Now, that understanding tends to be very fuzzy. From a pollen diagram, we tell a story that something along the lines of there was some woodland. Some can mean anything from 20% to 100% of a landscape. By combining our known environmental constraints and our general ecological ideas about, say, tree line limit, we can create an awful lot of possible past land cover scenarios. I've put three in my picture. We typically create tens of thousands of these possible maps. We then use the calibrated model of pollen dispersal and deposition to simulate the pollen count at our known sites in those landscapes, so the small circles in my figures. And that gives me a whole series of pollen assemblages. We can then compare them with the fossil assemblages, essentially using the same statistical methods we'd use for modern analog techniques. For pollen, modern analog is challenging because the whole landscape has changed so much since the past that actually finding analogs, particularly for the distance part of the pollen record, is very difficult. Modeling, we can imagine whatever we like. If the entire background of Britain was eucalyptus, we can imagine it. By using those statistical tests of similarity across multiple sites, we can then pull out which of those options is considered a likely reconstruction. And one strength of this is if there are several alternatives that all produce the same pollen records, the system will pull it out. So it incorporates the equifinality that's often missing in pollen record interpretation. So there are several ways we can use the output. With multiple sites, 
the main thing we do is look at the best fit between paleo data and model data across all the sites. That gives us land cover maps, which we can pull out, which we can both use to extract landscape metrics, so to discuss the openness, the amount of woodland, and use as a basis for thought experiments. Can, given we know where the archeology span is, which of these pollen sites might have been able to detect activity? What amount of activity is needed for the pollen record to see it? We also, of course, because we've got multiple sites, we get fits for individual sites. And the overall most likely option won't be the best for both sites. That gives us ideas about the variation in land cover within the landscape. We both use that to then refine and rerun the models to get better overall fits, but also gives us insight into landscape properties and particularly variation um, within the landscape in terms of resource distribution. So to briefly talk about two pieces of work in progress. The first one concerns work in the Orkney Islands. The map in the lower right shows Orkney as a group of islands off the north coast of Scotland. It's very well known for its Neolithic archaeology, largely because of a supposed absence of woodland and the very ready availability of building stone. The core area marked with the orange circle contains some really spectacular archaeological sites, including the Nessa Brogka Temple Complex and Barn House. These are very significant middle later Neolithic sites. The green dots on the map show the um, pollen sites that we had available, and you'll notice immediately they're not in the core area. Good old humans destroying wetlands right, left, and center. We have one possible site in there that we couldn't count within the scope of this project. We do have, from the red dots, pollen records associated with wet archaeological deposits that we could also use to cross-check our models with. So for the multiple scenario approach here, we managed to scrape together 103 dates on environmental core, on sediment records, which gave us 12 age depth models, so 12 different pollen sequences. We used that to bin the data into 200 year time slices across the Neolithic. Um, so that gave us 10 time slices in the case of Orkney. And we then set the model going. We ran about 300,000 possible landscapes through and screening it. And then at this stage, we focused in for each time slice on runs where we're looking at about two to 5,000. So once we've got an idea of the general characters, we're then running with finer discrimination. So some preliminary results. I'm sorry, the colors on the maps just are not coming out very well, um, technology. Before the start of the Neolithic in this area, 4,200 to 4,000 Cal BC, and the landscape is partly wooded. So the yellow is showing open grassland. The green speckles are, at the moment, individual stands of trees. One of the things we're doing is looking at the effects of scattered stands as opposed to woodlands. Well, that's ongoing work. By 3,400 to 3,200, which the archaeologists are calling the initial Neolithic, but is, really is the period when we start getting dates on the house sites, so as a paleoecologist, I think it probably started earlier before people built big houses that survived into the record. Um, what we see, and I think you can see even with the poor colour, is that the woodland is remaining in patchy areas through the spine of the island in the upland areas, but that in lowland areas, such as around the two big central locks, woodland cover is pretty much disappearing. There's another faint speckly area around the locks, which is showing the arrival of agriculturally disturbed land. Oops, go back. 2,800 to 2,600 years ago, the core area has pretty much been abandoned. There's a shift to the earliest um, Bronze Age, and you can see, though, that the lowland is not rewooding. It's still occupied, it's still got speckles. And although the upland, again, the colour seems to have changed slightly, that's because the upland is actually becoming less wooded, but we're seeing the spread of heathland. So the colours aren't coming out great. So from this, we're able to come up with some estimates of landscape characteristics. So for example, we've looked at the amount of woodland in the lowland areas, which in Orkney is defined as below 60 metres, which is believed to be the upper limit of cultivation at any point in prehistory and the upland areas, 
And you can see that that's allowed us to pull out two separate woodland declines. So there's one here in the lowland area, in the upland area, woodland persisting and then only disappearing up towards the end of the Neolithic period. There's also some scope to overlay that with archaeological data. The bars behind the histogram are actually my 200-year bins, and the blue bars are showing the uh, agriculturally worked land. The coloured overlays um, are the archaeological uh, profiles of the numbers of houses in use. They've got a much finer sliced age model, which gives them these nice smooth probability distributions. And you can see in red the core area and its abandonment very clearly, with green showing houses in the wider landscape. And what we appear to see is we, have, we do have this house phase, but that, again, agricultural activity is continuing beyond that. The second area we've been working in is the Somerset Levels and Moors, down in the southwest of Britain, where a series of rivers drain into the Bristol Channel through a lowland area surrounded by low hill ridges, which is characterised by extensive wetlands of various kinds, including, again, some very significant Neolithic archaeology. Most people have probably heard of the Sweet Track, if you know anything about the Holocene and European archaeology. Uh, this was a particular trackway in the uh, Willems where dendrochronology allowed them to date um, the construction to um, 3,807 in the spring. Um, so in this extensive wetland layer, again, we have pollen records from the wetland lowlands. You can see the clusters of red and yellow and pink dots. What we tend not to have is much idea of what's going on on the dry land. And since we're pretty sure Neolithic people aren't web footed, they're also going to have been living a lot of the time on the dry land and crossing and interacting with the wetlands. So again, the construction is slightly different colour scheme this time, unfortunately. Um, we didn't plan well for presentations. The greens in this case, the two shades of green, show lowland wet woods of different kinds in the river valleys. The mottled uh, red and grey area here is essentially salt marsh and marine influenced communities. The yellow shows up the woodland with the brown speckles being pastoral openings. And then the pink and grey are modelling the wetlands in a, a slightly simplified modelling, but modelling a mixture of bog and alder car. And you can see that the wetlands, particularly in the figure on the right, the wetlands have got quite different characters. Each site is allowed to have its own character, which will affect its own pollen signal, rather than treating them all as passive pollen receivers. On the left-hand side, you can see the, pre -near, the latest point that we consider to be before Neolithic, very little archaeological evidence for activity. And the dry land woodland at this point is not a closed woodland. We need to model some uh, openings in it. Now, again, this could be showing pre-Neolithic activity. Myself, I think it's quite natural in the ecology of a deciduous woodland to have openings in it. Um, and there's also elements of what's going on in the wetland. 3,807 is the date of the sweet track. And this is when we're seeing the earliest Neolithic activity in the area. And so that second time bin is showing a greater level of clearance, dry land, an opening in the dryland woodland. Again, we can come up with a regional summary. In this case, openness of landscape across the top, age bins going up the sides. And you can see, as I said, less open, opening with the arrival of the sweet track, and then a period of relatively closed forest opening. The variations, apparently, in the amount of openness in the wider landscape, and therefore possibly human activity. The very basal part of the record, you can see, appears to be the most open. We're pretty sure that this is actually about not understanding the paleogeography quite well enough. For 4,400 to 4,200, this is the end of a period of higher sea levels in the region. And for that period, we do have an estimated paleogeography map from ongoing work uh, from the University of Southampton. Um, and you can see that the sea is much further inland, the salt marshes are further inland. I think the openness in the uplands is actually driven by the fact that we haven't modelled the wet woodlands very well. 
We, you wouldn't have closed wet woodland. That should have been much marshier. So this is something we're tweaking with. But because we can incorporate the paleogeography, we can start to build this into our modeling. In summary, the multiple scenario approach um, we've shown here allows us a means of landscape reconstruction <coughs> from pollen records, um, which includes variations in site character. We can model what the site's up to and allow for it rather than just hoping it goes away as noise. It allows equifinality. It deliberately seeks out alternative um, solutions, which I think is something as pollen analysts we're fairly bad at. It provides outputs in the form of maps and also quantified outputs, which make life much easier when we want to communicate with end users like ecologists or archaeologists or, of course, more general audiences. Having a good age model is critical since we're linking sites, but I don't need to tell an audience like this that. And our ongoing work is, say, larger patches of land cover, for Somerset, better paleogeography, publication of what we've done so far, and the bit I'm really bad at, grant writing. If anyone has any good ideas on that, I'm always open to suggestions. Thank you. My presentation is about new lights on human environment interactions in the northern French Alps, pro provided by Lex Sediment DNA. So in the Alps, there is a, a long story of human exploitation, especially due to, probably due to the large diversity of resources that are available for hunting and gathering, and later for the development of pastoral and agricultural activities and with a specificity related with the uh, altitudinal range, which is the vertical mobility according to the season and uh, the development of different types of land use related with the ecological zones. We also have a quite large diversity of uh, geological resources, which led to the development of mining activities. And as you probably know, mountains are very sensitive to climatic and uh, environmental changes, and especially, especially to erosion dynamics. So our question is, how did agro-pastoral activities and mountain people environment interactions, interactions change across space and time in the Alps? So to reply to this question, we used an integrated approach of the socio-ecosystem using lake sediment because lake sediment can record at the same time the changes in environment, environment and uh, like soil erosion history using sedimentology and geochemical uh, data. And we can also access to um, other uh, environmental changes like landscape changes using uh, quite classical uh, methodologies like pollen data or new uh, methods or emerging tools like, which are lake sediment DNA. So the lake sediment DNA started in the mid 90s and was mainly focused uh, at the beginning on aquatic organisms. And since now around 10 years ago, they started to look at the terrestrial organisms in the lake sediment, so like plant DNA and then uh, mammal DNA. So this tool uh, allowed to have access to quite pre the precise nature of agro-pastoral activities and also to landscape changes like plant cover changes. So we apply this, uh, these tools on um, four different lakes locat located in the north part of the French Alps here. Three of the lakes here and here are located uh, above the tree line today in the Halpage, and uh, one lake is at lower altitude here, around 900 meters of altitude. So now let's go to the results on pastoral activities and uh, erosion dynamics. So on, on this lake, the Lake Hanterne, uh, we find maybe a first pa pastoral evidence uh, in the lake sediment uh, during the late Neolithic and uh, early Bronze Age, with the presence in uh, one sample of, um, of DNA from cattle, but it's just uh, one sample and it's not a lot of DNA found in this uh, sample, so we are not sure uh, we really have uh, this uh, activity at this time. But at the same time, we record a decrease in pinus uh, DNA here, 
so a decrease in uh, tree uh, cover in the catchment, and at the same time, we have a peak in erosion dynamic. But as we probably know, uh, this period, uh, around 4,800 4, years ago, is uh, between um, in a transition uh, period in terms of climatic change from the Holocene climatic optimum to, uh, towards the neoglacial period. And the next uh, evidence of uh, DNA from uh, animals is uh, during the late Bronze Age here with um, some uh, detection of DNA from sheep, but it's not a lot of detection and it's just in two samples. But at the same time, we, we also see an increase here in uh, Plantago DNA, and Plantago is a species associated with, uh, in general, development of pastoral activities. And again, at the same time, we record a change in erosion dynamic with a tipping point here. But we know also there is a, a climatic degradation at this time, so again, the erosion increase here can be also triggered by climatic change. If we go now at lower altitude, around 900 meters of altitude, we have also evidence of the presence of cattle during the, the late Neolithic period, and also some detections of plantago. But at this time, we were in a forested uh, areas with uh, fear, as we can see here, for example, and I didn't present it here, but uh, there is also alder and uh, beach in the area. So it's a completely different uh, pastoral um, practices if there was pastoral practices in this place at the same time. Now, uh, we have very nice evidence of uh, pastoral activities for the Iron Age uh, here and Roman period for this lake and the uh, Roman period for these two lakes here. So uh, it's uh, the highest altitude lakes above the tree line. And we, we have so sheep and uh, cattle on most of the lakes at the same time, not on this one. But uh, we also can see an increase in erosion with uh, very huge peaks recorded in this lake, smaller peaks in this lake compared to the rest of the record. And here we have more a trend toward a tipping point in erosion dynamic. If we go now at lower altitude, in the, at 900 meters of altitude, we also record high erosion here, and at the same time a decrease in uh, um, fear DNA, suggesting a clear forest clearance at this time, and evidence of uh, DNA from Plantago and Rumex, which suggests the development of uh, pastoral activities also uh, related with the forest clearance. But as we can see, we didn't detect uh, DNA from animals. So we think that we had at this time uh, more extensive uh, pastoral activities and not a lot of DNA provided uh, to the lake and we are not able to detect it with our method. But if we go now at a lower altitude, so around 200 meters, in a very big lake, the Lake Bourget, with a very big catchment, and this lake is in the catchment and the other lake on turn also, and at this, this time we can see also an increase in erosion dynamic here recorded uh, with the ge geochemical elements, the titanium, as for this lake here. And if we look at uh, the record of uh, glacier fluctuation, we can see this period is uh, in a phase with a glacial retreat, so which means we have a warm and dry uh, climate during this period. So we think that we can explain all these erosion peaks in all the lakes uh, with um, uh, relation related with uh, pastoral activities at this time. So we have a huge uh, regional uh, erosion traces during the Roman period. Now, if we move to the medieval period, we can see a new increase in uh, pastoral activities with uh, um, sheep and uh, cattle on all the lakes except this one. And uh, at the beginning, we have uh, animal, uh, sheep and cattle, but then we, we shift with mainly uh, cattle only cattle even, in all the three lakes. So we have a change in uh, pastoral activities and practices in this place. 
probably related with the development of uh, economic activities related with uh, milk um, from cattle. And yes, I forgot something. And we can see that uh, at the beginning on this lake, on this lake here, we don't have an impact of pastoral activities on erosion dynamic. Here we can see even a decrease in erosion and the erosion start to increase again during the Little Ice Age in both lakes. So we think that we have a change in uh, human practices to limit soil erosion and to have a more sustainable uh, activity and to, to, to have more soils to follow the activities. So now let's go at uh, the lowest altitude site just to have uh, more uh, information about uh, um, agricultural activities because we are at a lower altitude so we can grow uh, cereals, for example, or other uh, vegetables and fruits. So the huge peak in erosion that we can see here is, um, is probably due to the development of uh, cereal crops. And here we have hemp and uh, here beans. So this huge, uh, huge, huge uh, erosion increase is related with this uh, agricultural activities, and then the decrease in erosion corresponds to the development, the div diversification of activities with uh, uh, fruit trees, with prunus here and pyrus, and uh, here uh, uh, grapes and um, uh, nuts. So we think that the development of these uh, fruit trees maybe help to, to limit the erosion, or maybe people started to, to build some terraces in the catchment to limit erosion, or maybe to limit uh, better the different parcels and with uh, small uh, shrubs or trees. And uh, if we don't have an impact on erosion, we have a change in um, in the terrestrial and aquatic uh, ecosystems in terms of nutrient uh, um, uh, con concentration. So we have an increase in nutrient content in this uh, aquatic and terrestrial uh, ecosystem, as we can see with these two species, which have uh, nutrient-rich ecological preferences. So now let's go to the conclusion and to the take-home messages. So what I think is interesting to remember is uh, the wide-scale erosion um, that we record during the Roman period in all the sites, and even in, the, in a very big lake uh, with a re regional uh, record. And this uh, regional scale erosion is probably due to the development of pastoral activities in this uh, area. And then during the medieval period, we have again uh, the development of an intense pastoral activities around three of the four lakes with a change in animal composition, but we have uh, no impact on erosion on two of the three, three lakes, probably due to the change in, uh, in practices. And I think it's imp important to remember also that lake sediment DNA in this case provided very nice uh, information to better understand the human activities and, and um, uh, how alpine people develop uh, their activities in this type of environment, and also to better understand the erosion dynamic in the area. And thanks for your attention, and thank you to all my co collaborators who worked on this uh, lace. Thank you very much, Jolene, for an excellent presentation, and I really think it's very nice to see how clearly you indicate the different uh, human impact. Uh, I wanted, have you also looked at the data in terms of impact of human activity on, on the diversity of species? You mean the impact of human activities on what? On the diversity of, for example, plant species, the native plants. Ah, the diversity of plants. Mm. That's what you say. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't present uh, the results here, but um, uh, on the first lake I presented, the Lake Antern, we, we can see, um, I don't remember the data in terms of the number of species re recorded, but we can see an increase of um, plants related with pastoral activities like plantago and plants with an uh, open um, uh, environment, like Eliantem numularium and this type of, of plants. And um, for the lakes at uh, 
900 meters of altitude. Um, I think we, we increase the diversity because uh, just uh, people grow more plants. So we increase the diversity of what we record due to, to these activities. And for the other lakes, I don't remember the results for plants <laughs> because it's the work of my collaborators. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the talk, that was really nice. Um, I have a question that's maybe a bit similar to, to Inger's about like the whole picture that you see from the sedimentary DNA because you showed mainly really the, um, the cultivated plants and, and, and the animals. And as you <laughs> of course know, these are also exactly the taxa that we're always worried about that might be contaminants or for whatever from the lab. And so I was wondering if you have corroborating evidence, for example, from the diversity of the whole picture or pollen data or historical records. Um, that kind of go together with exactly what you're showing. Yeah, so we have pollen data for the lake at uh, the smaller, the lowest altitude, and uh, we have the data that fit quite well, but not for all the, the taxa. And I think the difference are mainly due to taphonomic processes, and especially the connection between the place where the plants grow and the lake. So. There is some times where we don't record the DNA of some plants that I think there was in the catchment, but disconnected uh, from the lake in terms of transfer for the DNA. Ah, so, so you think that then that's why you're not finding it in other records, or, or we can, otherwise we can discuss it? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, uh, as you gather, it's, uh, I'm not Jesse Woodbridge, uh, who isn't able to make it, and I'm also the very last talk, so um, in this case, last or almost certainly will be least, but never mind. Uh, at least uh, we're here in Mediterranean Europe, and that'll be the theme for this talk. Um, this is a midterm report on a project which involves uh, three of us at Plymouth who are working on pollen data and three archaeologists from University College London um, uh, on, a, on a project uh, funded by the UK Levy Hume uh, Foundation. And it's really to address these kind of questions. Um, how far uh, did rises and falls in population influence uh, the shift from um, a more nature-dominated to a human or culturally modified uh, set of landscapes, in, in this case in the Mediterranean? Um, how far can we address the, uh, the claim that the Mediterranean is actually a ruined landscape, or how far uh, is that actually a misleading claim? And, and what are the spatial and temporal variations of, of different landscapes across the area? So in order to try and, and tackle those, we're using two independent data sets. On the one hand, we're looking at land cover uh, through pollen, and in so doing, feeding in, obviously, to the land cover 6K synthesis. But we're also doing so using an independent data set from uh, archaeological sources, um, uh, as, but as far as possible from the same area. So I'm just going to run through briefly what those data sources are before giving one or two uh, preliminary results on the pollen side. For the archaeology, um, we've already heard uh, during the course of, of today and the rest of the conference how one can use radiocarbon dates as a data source, as a proxy for rural population. And this is something which has been done quite extensively by, by Stephen Shannon, in particular for Northern Europe. And the numbers of radiocarbon dates uh, available is really quite large, as you can see, um, just for the Rome uh, area, for example, 8,000 dates. And the idea of, of putting those together to provide uh, long-term population dynamics, so long as you've got uh, sufficient data and, and sufficiently robust statistical methods is, is now, I think, quite well uh, attested. So, so for, for, for the whole of the Holocene, this provides a, a key approach. But I think once you move to the historic period, then archaeologists uh, tend to give up using radiocarbon dates because they've got pottery instead. Um, and so once you move to the historic periods, then there's an automatic drop-off in the number of radiocarbon dates, and you have to turn to alternative source. And the alternative source, which is the second uh, data source being used to reconstruct um, uh, demographic change is from systematic regional archaeological surveys, of which there are very many in the Mediterranean. <coughs> and uh, the archaeological researcher on, on this, uh, Alessio Palmisano, has been um, putting together published data sets, and you can see, um, for example, in this case in uh, central Italy, uh, that around uh, a fifth of the total area 
um, uh, has actually been surveyed in some way or another, and those data can be uh, put into, uh, have been put in, to a database which allows long-term uh, settlement uh, trajectories to be established. And because we've got radiocarbon dates and because we've got this, we can do then a cross-comparison between the two. And if they agree, then obviously it gives you confidence that the trends are real. That's for the archaeology, and I won't say more about the archaeology now. I I I'll say uh, something instead about the pollen. And here we're using uh, two primary data sets. Firstly, uh, data that are uh, widely publicly available through the European Pollen Database uh, and the modern European Modern Pollen Database. Um, and from that, there are around uh, 100 uh, paleo sites, Holocene sites, and something like 1,600 surface samples, which together generate a little over 4,000 uh, uh, pollen spectra for the Mediterranean. And those have now got uh, relatively robust chronologies from. Uh, uh, synthesis that was coordinated by, by Thomas Giseke. And you can see the distribution of sites, of those sites uh, for paleo sites and of modern sites. And obviously, the, you know, it's not a perfect distribution. North Africa, in particular, is very poorly represented, um, partly because it's relatively arid, uh, but partly simply because the research has not been done. So the coverage, the spatial coverage, is, is not perfect. You can see Iberia is very well represented, uh, but, say, uh, Tunisia is not. Um, the, the, the second data set that we're using is pollen... Uh, data which are non-EPD um, and in a way we're sort of slightly reluctant to do that because it's better to use uh, data which is fully publicly available and we are encouraging uh, people that we're collaborating with to, to in fact to add their data to the, to, to the European database. But we're taking six different case study regions where we've got good archaeological and pollen data coverage so we've got spatial congruence so we've got one, for example, in eastern Iberia, one in southern France, another in Italy, one in southern Greece, one in southwestern and central Turkey, and one in the Levant. Um, and those are areas where we've got sufficiently good uh, archaeological data, but also once we add in um, additional sites to the EPD sites, we've got enough pollen records to produce a, what we, we hope is a regionally representative record of uh, regional land cover change. Um, just to place this in a climatic context, um, the blue area shows the area of modern climate space, so temperature, summer temperature on the vertical axis, winter precipitation on the horizontal axis, so the blue area is the area of Mediterranean climate, the yellow there is the area uh, of, uh, of paleo sites, and red is the modern surface sites. So we've got quite good coverage of the of Mediterranean climate space, except for this area here, which is the most arid part of the Mediterranean climate, that's essentially North Africa. Mm. So, having taken, uh, got those 4,000 uh, samples, uh, both modern and paleo, because we were anxious not only to look at paleo records, but also to, to relate them to modern land cover, uh, we've uh, put those into a, a cluster analysis, and that generates a diagram like the one shown here, uh, which is totally unreadable. Um, but by taking those and using both the frequency and then the abundance of taxa, it's possible to identify clusters uh, of uh, pollen uh, groupings. Now, this is a little different from the approach that the, we were using for a previous project in Northern Europe, where we modified the biomization approach. Um, uh, uh, and where the categories of land cover were imposed from above, here we're letting the classification be led by the data themselves, and it also allows uh, each pollen taxa to be part of more than one group, rather than, for example, oak only being part of deciduous forest, it also could potentially be part of other landscapes types. So if we take this, the most classic of all Mediterranean land cover, olive groves or olive woods, we can't distinguish them based on pollen taxonomy alone, you can see that, not surprisingly, that the, the most characteristic dominant taxa in that cluster is Oliaceae, but it also has uh, other elements like evergreen oak, grass, uh, and, and so forth, which contribute to that. Um, so in, in this system, we're, we're not imposing uh, classifications, we're allowing them to emerge. So how many clusters should we use? Well, um, in our previous work on Northern Europe, we ended up with eight. So we could uh, 
pr produce eight clusters, it was a rough guide, uh, and if we did that, we would end up, for example, with uh, one representing fir forest, but we would also end up combining olive groves with steppe parkland, uh, sclerophyllous scrub, and, and various other types. So what we have done is take our major eight clusters, but then produce uh, a further subdivision, so a hierarchical classification, which in the end produces 16 clusters. The olive groves, for example, only emerge as an identifiable group at the 15 cluster level. So we've taken a whole series of different cluster sizes and looked at the patterns that emerge, and 16 has ended up as a, what we think is a, is a, is a reasonably optimal group. Um, if we take uh, those and look at individual uh, plant taxa, you can see that for trees and shrubs, the patterning is quite clear. So, for example, there is the olive groves, and you can see olive groves have a single taxon which dominates, and it's not surprisingly olive. If you move to the next one up, that's evergreen oak, that's dominated by evergreen oak pollen. So most classes are dominated by, by a single taxon. When we move to NAP, to non tree pollen, it's a little less clear. There are a couple in here where you have clear groups. Uh, interestingly enough, we talked earlier on about sedge, and actually sedge does emerge as a distinct cluster, and we think it is a real cluster, not just an artifact of local pollen, although clearly in some sites it can be. Uh, but if you take this one, uh, this is a kind of grassland arable area, you can see although poaceae is the dominant element, there are many other taxa which are present at lower uh, 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 concentrate lower percentage concentrations as well. So let's have a look at some very preliminary results. This is simply taking all those Mediterranean pollen diagrams and combining them together. And clearly, this is losing a lot of, a lot of information. Uh, it's going to be much more informative, I think, when we do this, which we actually already have, at a regional level and also, for example, by elevation. But for today, I'll just stick to a pan-Mediterranean uh, view, and what we've got there are uh, the 16 different clusters, the, NA, the open ones are shown in orange, the, the, the forested ones in green through time. Um, just to give an example, there's fir forest, uh, that shows the well-known rise of mid-Holocene rise in, in fir forest, subsequent decline. Interestingly enough, fir hardly appears at all in the surface modern pollen samples, reflecting partly where the samples were taken, but also the fact that fir forests have substantially declined uh, in very recent times. Also shown here on the right-hand side is the more traditional um, uh, AP, that's the total percentage of arboreal pollen. Uh, now, there are all sorts of limits in how we interpret that, but at face value, that suggests that the forest maximum occurred in the Mediterranean between 9 and 8,000 years ago, um, and that there was a significant decline in forest cover uh, in the last 3,000 years. Remembering that that AP total includes cultivated trees, so that some of that element is, is, is actually uh, agricultural landscapes, olive groves and, and, and chestnut and, and even uh, evergreen oak, for example. The other and perhaps more interesting diagram uh, curve on this is the one next to it, and that's the ratio of change. This is a kind of rate of change analysis. And, and what it shows is that early in the Holocene, you had relatively high but declining rates of change, a, a, a minimal rate of change in the mid Holocene, uh, five, six, seven thousand years ago, and then an increase in landscape turnover uh, in the last 4,000 years. Uh, but oscillating with periods of more rapid change, for example, in the post-classical period, uh, and periods of, of lower change. So we seem to have this kind of tripartite uh, division of a relatively uh, dynamic early Holocene landscape, a more stable mid-Holocene landscape, and uh, a more dynamic one in the later Holocene. And of course, the question is why? Um, and we can't to have a definitive answer to that question, but if we take that rate of change curve, which you can see in the middle there, and compare it against some other proxies, this is a climate stack of stable isotope data, this is the z-scores of um, uh, charcoal, so it's a, a proxy for fire regime, um, uh, and then on the left-hand side are the sum of open pollen uh, uh, taxa clusters and NAP sum. So these are two different measures of landscape openness, and this is a measure of, of climate between wet and dry. Uh, what we can see from that is, in the early part of the record, you've got a period when uh, fire regimes, there was a lot of landscape burning. You also had a shift from a drier to a wetter climate, um, um, uh, and you had landscapes which were relatively well wooded, 
it seems reasonable to infer that that uh, was a landscape in which climate was the primary driver. In the mid-Holocene, we seem to have a pattern which is more complex, where almost certainly there were elements of both human and climatic in, in, engagement. But interestingly enough, once you move to the last three and a half thousand years, you get a divergence between the, the climate trend um, and the, the landscape openness. Landscapes become more open, but the climate is also getting wetter. You've also got no significant change towards uh, a higher burning regime as you did in the early Holocene. So the inference is that, is that in the last three and a half thousand years, that essentially humans are taking over uh, the, the, the the, the major driver of landscape change, particularly in the uh, period since about 1,000 or 1,500 years ago. So, in conclusion, um, I think we can see the Mediterranean from these data as a landscape that was uh, perpetually changing, constantly dynamic uh, and adapted to, uh, to a range of different disturbances. Some of those disturbances take place over longer time scales, some of them are over, over much shorter uh, time scales. So those multiple agencies can potentially, and almost certainly did, operate not on their, just on their own, but synergistically. So fire and drought, grazing activity, human activity, and climate all interacting. But certainly from about 3,500 years ago, that's to say from the end of the Bronze Age, there was a reduction in the total tree cover, which is likely to be uh, largely driven by human uh, activity. One thing I think is, is worth noting is that this is very much a kind of big data project, and in that context, having we've, we've here adopted a, a relatively unsupervised approach uh, to look at patterns of variations, and that may be something which is, is useful more generally. Um, and when we get finally um, in the next year or so to doing the comparison of the archaeological data set, then uh, we hope to be able to get a, a more critical assessment of how uh, natural agencies like climate and people were in transforming the Mediterranean landscape. Thank you very much.